with you, and I welcome you to this edition of Monday Night Manor. If you've never been with me on these Monday nights, let me tell you very briefly what it is that I do. You know, when the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years, God fed them in three different ways. Let me just change this here. There we go. God fed them in three different ways. He fed them, of course, with water so that they would survive in the, in the desert, in the wilderness. And when they were complaining, he gave them quail for meat. But he also gave them something called manna. This was a dew-like substance, a bread-like substance that they would find on the ground six days a week. And they would come out of their tents and they would find this bread-like substance on the ground, which they would collect. That was their physical manna and it sustained them for 40 years. What I do on these Monday nights is try to give us some spiritual manna, something that will feed us spiritually, something directly from the Bible. And my prayer is that whatever we take away from these Monday evenings, it's something that we can use to strengthen us, to encourage us, to fill us with the word of God throughout the week, something that we can reflect on, something that we can chew on. And so the last couple of Monday nights, we have been spending time in Psalm 119. Now, just a brief recap, and I hope that you've been spending time also in Psalm 119. It is the largest chapter in all of the Bible. It has 176 verses in it, and yes, the Psalms are counted as chapters. Now, the interesting thing about Psalm 119 is it is broken up into 22 sections of eight verses each. It's what's known as an acrostic, and it is based on the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And I know that the first time we were together, we looked at the first eight verses, and I believe last week we looked at the final eight verses. What I wanted to do tonight, and, and here's what I challenged you on, and I'm just going to ask you right now if you were challenged to this. I had challenged you to take one section each day, just eight verses, and read them and reflect on them and highlight or circle anything that's speaking to you. If there's a psalm that we need to focus on, it is Psalm 119 because almost every single verse talks about God's word or his testimonies or his ordinances. It's all different synonyms to represent this, the word of God. Everything must focus on the word of God. If we're serious with God, if we mean business with God, then we need to be serious about his word. And so tonight, I just want to point out a few verses that you probably already know. You may not even know they belong to Psalm 119, but they're verses that we all know that we've heard. Uh, many of these verses have been put into music. There are several of them right away that I think of off the top of my head. And then there's other verses here as I was just reading this over the last few minutes before I came on the air here. I was just reading some of these verses and I continue to get convicted. So let me challenge you once again if you haven't spent time in psalm 119 anytime recently then i encourage you to take one section per day for the next 22 days and you will be amazed at what god is going to show you and the conviction and the love you will have again for the word of god well let me start right here just with a, a one that we all know if you have your bibles with you if you're taking notes we're going to look at psalm 119 and just go right to a very familiar verse verse 11 i'll bet you some of you can quote it psalm 119 verse 11 says this your word or thy word have i hid or treasured in my heart that i may not sin against thee Thy word have I hid or treasured in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Is that your desire? Do you have such a love for God's word? And is God's word deep in your heart that you desire not to sin against God? How many times in situations, and this has happened to me also, you come across something that is happening in the world, maybe something with a friend or a job situation. You know it goes against God's laws or God's rules. You know it's something that makes you uncomfortable. Is there a scripture during those times that kind of come to the surface? Because God's word is in your heart that you might not sin against thee. You know the difference between right and wrong. Not as the world says right and wrong. Oh, no, no. Because the world has a different set of standards. 
The world operates differently than the way God operates. And that's why in Psalm 4, verse 3, we are told that we are set apart. We're, we're called out. John 17, I believe, Jesus' priestly, high priestly prayer says that they, the apostles, the disciples were called out. We are called out from the world. Yes, we are in the world. Yes, we need to live and, and survive in the world and interact with the world. But that doesn't mean we have to be just like the world. God didn't call us to be just like the world. First John chapter 2 tells us, love not the world nor the things that are in the world. I've preached on that before. You can find that video and that teaching elsewhere uh, in my library of videos. If you're interested in that particular teaching, get in touch with me and I'll send it to you. But here's we, here we have this verse here, thy word, thy word, not my word, God's word, your word, Lord, have I hid or treasured in my heart that I might not sin against thee. What would you do if a friend of yours or a family member came to you and sought godly advice? Would you give them godly advice strictly from scripture or would you kind of sidestep it? Suppose somebody was in an immoral relationship or they were having an affair, or they stole something, whatever the case would be. It's something that's in violation of the way God has called us to live. And they came to you for advice. What would you do? Would you give them worldly advice? Or would God's word bubble up inside of you? And because it's hidden in your heart that you not sin against them, you would tell them directly what the word of God says. And even more so, if you are put in a compromising situation, would God's word come up and bubble up because it's buried in your heart, it's treasured in it that you wouldn't sin against God? Or are you in a situation where maybe you have sinned against God? We know there's forgiveness through Christ. We know there's forgiveness in God. But there's one particular verse that you and I could meditate on for the rest of this evening and just think about the goodness of God's word and the richness of God's word just through one little verse. Let me just pick another one out here as I'm just looking through here. Here's another one that I know was made into a hymn. Psalm 119 verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes and I shall observe them to the end. I don't want to start singing for you, but you probably already know that hymn. Teach me, O oh Lord, teach me. That is an open spirit. That's saying, God, I want you to teach me, show me, instruct me, guide me in the right direction. Teach me, O oh Lord, the ways of your statutes, your word, your commandments. Teach it to me your way, Lord. I don't want to do things my way. I don't want to live a life where I'm preaching or pastoring as I do, and at the same time, I'm living a life that is not pleasing to God, that God would not be happy with, that I would be living a life of compromise. What kind of a, what kind of a Christian would I be, let alone a Bible teacher or a pastor? What kind of a Christian, what kind of a Christian man would I be if I was living a compromised life or I decided that I wanted to live in the world, but I also wanted to live for God? Can we do both? I think we can do both as long as we are very, very, very careful that we don't cross over the line into anything that is immoral, illegal, or anything, quite frankly, that goes against this. We have to obey certain laws in this land. We have to obey our leaders that God has placed over us. We are called to pray for them. But that doesn't mean that we have to go along with everything the world says is okay. There are a lot of things in this world, particularly even in these days with this challenge of this coronavirus and the things that are happening in the world. There are a lot of things that are just flat out wrong that a Christian should not be involved in, have nothing to do with. And we need to be able to stand on the word of God. And so the psalmist is saying just in this very one verse, teach me, O Lord, teach me. Well, how do we get taught? by spending time in the Word of God. I don't know what your Bible habits are. I hope and I pray that you are in the Word every single day. There's one place to find absolute truth in the Bible. There's only one book that God wrote, the Bible. 
There's only one place that we can find out about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the Bible. No other place. Oh, there's millions of books that have been written about the Bible, but there's only one Bible. I pray that you spend quality time, particularly if many of us are now uh, on stay at home and, and sheltered orders right now, you may find more time on your hands. I sure do. But then again, I work from home for the most part anyway. I'm in this book every day. That's not a boast. That's just, I need that. This is my cry to God. Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes. And what is the result of that? And I shall observe it to the end. I'm going to obey it. I'm going to pay attention to it. I'm going to focus on it unto the end. What end? The end of my life. I am going to obey the word of God until God calls me home and I get my heavenly reward and I'm finally home meeting Jesus face to face. And I have received that gift of eternal life and the crown of righteousness. So that's what, I, when I see this, does this excite you? Does this stir something up in you? Does this maybe cause you to say, hey, wait a minute, maybe I'm lacking a little bit, Lord. So maybe your prayer tonight is, Lord, you teach me. Teach me the ways of your statutes. And in return for that, Lord, if you teach me, I will obey them unto the end. I was looking at another one here. Like I said, there's 176 verses here. Here is one that I saw and I thought, wow, see if any of us do this. Psalm 119, verse 164. Seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous ordinances. Again, ordinances, laws, the word of God, statutes. Seven times a day I praise you. Is that you? Do you praise God seven times a day? Maybe you praise him more than seven times. Maybe it's less than seven times. Maybe you go through a whole day and there's nothing that you praise God about. Well, let me just share this with you. You know, I, I praise God each morning when I wake up and he's given me another day to serve him. I praise God and I pray to God each and every time I have a meal because God has provided for me. I praise God at the end of each day that he has seen me through safely through the day. One of the things I repeat every night is, Lord, thank you for getting me, getting us through another day, for guiding us, for keeping us safe, for providing for our needs. That's praising him. That's praising God. And I do that. Can I say it seven times every single day? No. But do you see what the psalmist is saying here? His mindset is such that even if it was more than seven times a day, or if it was less than seven times a day, his mindset is seven times a day, I will praise you. The psalmist is reminding us, is telling us, are you praising God? Why? Why would we praise God? And the answer is in the rest of 164. Because of your righteous ordinances. Righteous God's word is right. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. Are we willing to live life God's way? Are we willing to give up things in our life that are not godly, that would not bring glory to his name? Are we willing to give up those bad habits and maybe have to say goodbye to some people in our lives that are just not good influences for us? Are we willing to sacrifice some pleasure time in our life to go and serve someone? Particularly now during this virus, we see people that are out delivering food and volunteering for this and that, and that's wonderful. And my concern is what happens after this, when the virus dies down or dies out, are we still going to see that same kind of volunteerism right now and including our church as well we're on a virtual platforms we now have to broadcast because churches are closed down and we now have to broadcast over social media for some people for some people like myself this is old hat i've been doing this for years but for some people this is new to actually attend a church online uh, and not have a personal interaction where you can hug someone or you can just shake someone's hand. We're now meeting through electronic means, but it's still church. And we should still have that hunger for church. And one day when the church is reopened, 
many of us will be flocking back into our church. What I'm praying through all of this is that more people get passionate about this book. More people get passionate and interested in God, particularly through this virus. And I don't know if God is bringing this as a judgment. I don't think he is. I think this is just a natural course of events that happens because th this is, while it's a deadly virus, we've had other deadly viruses too. I'm not belittling it, but there are some that believe, oh, this is a judgment of God and Christ will be here tomorrow. I don't personally believe that because I believe the Bible teaches that many, many more things have to happen before Jesus comes back. But as I was saying, when I look at this and I study Psalm 119 and I see the insistence over and over and over again, the desire to know God's word, to be convicted by his word, to understand his word and to live by his word. Are you of that mindset where you say, God, if I'm reading this in your word, then I better pay attention to it because you said it. And God's word is the final authority. Some people don't like when I say this. God's word is the final authority in all matters of doctrine, all matters of faith. Whoa, that's a pretty heavy statement. Yeah, it is. But God's word is final. You either accept it or you dismiss it. It's like with Jesus. You either accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior or you reject him. You either accept Jesus that he paid for your sins on Calvary and that all of your sins, past, present, and future, have been paid for on the cross of Calvary by Jesus. You either believe that you have the gift of eternal life when he overcame death and he rose again, he overcame death, and he gave us the gift, the free gift of eternal life. You either believe that or you reject it. You may say, hey, that's kind of black and white, it's kind of cut and dried. Yeah, it is. The gospel is that way. We're either with God or we're against God. Two kingdoms in this world. You have the kingdom of God and you have the kingdom of Satan. And all of us belong to one kingdom or the other. What kingdom do you belong to tonight? Where are you at? I pray that you're in the kingdom of God. I'm in the kingdom of God. Let's look at another one here. What is another verse that you can quote from Psalm 119? I'll bet you it's Psalm 119 verse 105. Did we do that one yet tonight? No. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about the difference here. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, thy word, your word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now we know that that's a song. Many people have recorded that song. We could probably just sing that right now. I'm not going to. I won't torture you with that. But you knew that that came from Psalm 119. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Let's talk about that. A lamp. What does a lamp do? It sheds light on something. There's a difference between lamp and a light. And I'm going to show you that right now. Think about this. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light that's shining down so we can see where it is we're going. It's a light unto our feet to make sure that we are walking in righteousness, that we are walking in holiness, that we are walking in obedience to God's word. But not only is the word just a lamp that will light us up and tell us where we're going. It's not just that lamp, but it's a light unto my path. That's different than just looking down at your feet. The path gives the indication. It gives the connotation of movement on my path. Where am I going in life? Where are you going in life? Are you following God's path or are you following your own path? Are you following? Can you say that God's word is a lamp to your feet and then it's also a light to your path? So no matter where you're going, no matter what you're doing in life, no matter who you're with, listen to this. Is it wherever you're at? How do I want to say this? Wherever you're at in life, can you see God's light on your path? There's a question. Can you not only see God's lamp upon your feet so you see where you're going? Well, once you get going, has God's light continued along the path you're taking? Or did you suddenly somehow walk in the darkness? You somehow strayed off and now God's light is not leading your path. Now there's something we need to consider. You ever think of that verse just this way? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet 
and a light to my path. God is with us as we're standing there, and God continues with us wherever we're going, unless we stray. And the whole key is God's word. The whole key is God's word. And, and I cannot stress this enough. And if I sound over these years like a broken record, I make no apology for it. I, I, impl I implore you to get into this word and study it and read it. If we mean business with God, if we love Jesus, if he's our Lord and Savior, why would not we want to know everything there is to know about God? And there's one place to find out right here. From Genesis, Revelation, 66 books. And when I look at Psalm 119 and I see the insistence here, I see the same thing happening over verse after verse after verse after verse. Look at this one. I just looked, this just caught my eye here. Verse 81, my soul languishes for your salvation. I wait for your word. You feel the insistent there? Your, my soul, my very soul, my eternal soul languishes. Oh, it aches. It, it aches for your salvation, Lord, not my salvation, not my way, your way, Lord. I wait for your word. There's a hunger there. I wait for your word. Every time I open that Bible, God, what else are you going to teach me today? What else am I going to preach today? And, and I understand you may be thinking, well, Thomas, you, you're a pastor and you're a Bible teacher. You're a preacher. Yes, I am. That's what God has called me to do. That's what I do. But that doesn't mean that I should or would be spending more time in the word than someone else. This is my calling. This is what God has called me to do. God has called you to do something else, but that's no excuse for not being in the word. It's no excuse for not learning under godly teachers and godly preachers and godly pastors. There's no excuse for that. We all have opportunities to be in the word. You can listen to the word while you're walking or jogging. Or you know what? Many times I have earbuds in when I'm doing household chores. I'm doing the dishes and I'm listening to something. We don't always have to have it in writing. We have such an advantage to be in the word that none of us should ever have an excuse ever, ever, ever to say, well, I didn't have time for the word. We must make the word a priority. You can't just make it an option. And I hope here's another one. Psalm 119 verse 97 this one just caught my eye. oh how i love your law it is my meditation all the day your commandments make me wiser than my enemies how about that we learn god's word and his commandments make us wiser than all of our enemies who are our enemies and by the way i realize that i'm tossing a lot out at you tonight if it seems like this manna is scattered and all over the place, it's only because Psalm 119 is so rich. We could spend probably another two or three months just picking out verses and going through this and just seeing the, the richness. That's what I hope that you do. One section per night or per day, eight verses. Meditate upon them. Circle them. Highlight. If You, saw, you can't see it, but if you saw my Bible, it's all marked up. It's all marked up. Because as God is speaking to me, as the Holy Spirit is enlightening me and encouraging me, I'm highlighting things. I'm putting things down. Some of them are sermon ideas. Some of them are personal convictions. Some of them I need for Bible study for myself. But you look at the richness here. Thank you, by the way. You look at the richness here. And you look at, oh, you know, look at this. Here, Psalm, here's Psalm 119, verse 102. Look at this. I have not turned aside from your ordinances, for you yourself have taught me. I have not turned aside from your ordinances, your word, your commandments, your statutes. I have not turned aside. Do you know why? Because you yourself have taught me. The Holy Spirit has taught me, has taught you. If we're being taught by the very best teacher ever, of course, Almighty God himself, who wrote this book, and the Holy Spirit is applying this to our life and to our hearts and giving us understanding and giving us wisdom, would that be your mindset 
Would that be your mindset? That I'm not turned aside from them. I'm not turning aside. I am going to stay focused. Do you know why, Lord? Because you yourself taught them to me. If we cannot take God seriously, if we cannot take his word seriously, then nothing in this world is serious. If we cannot be grounded in the word of God, if we cannot be grounded, then our lives will go all over the place. How many times do we see people off the rails doing dumb things, doing things that they shouldn't be doing? You and I have done dumb things. We probably still do, even though we're saved. We do stupid things sometimes, but we have to go and repent before God. But could any of us who are true believers, sons and daughters of the almighty God, could we say to God right now, Lord, I have not turned away from your commandments. I've not turned away from your word because you yourself, you've taught me this. And if you have taught me this, how dare I, how dare I or you decide we want to turn away? Because if that happens, we need to seriously question our commitment to Christ. We have to seriously commit and understand maybe we're not saved. Maybe we're not really a child of God because if we can turn away from the word and just throw it away after God himself has taught us, is that a red flag? Yeah, that's a red flag. Wow, look at how rich this psalm is. Psalm 119, 176 verses. We've already scratched the surface over the last three Mondays. Just scratched the surface. My prayer for you, as we close this, my prayer for you is that you will start spending time in Psalm 119. Start spending time in it. Let God convict you. Let some of these statements that the psalmist made. And by the way, I think I mentioned this before, and this is worth mentioning. There's no definitive uh, information on this, but it's more than likely that one of three men wrote Psalm 119. It was either David, Ezra, or Daniel. It was one of those three. Most Bible scholars think it's one of those three. And you're welcome, by the way. And so here's what I want to leave you with. I challenge you once again, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, read Psalm 119. Discover the richness of this psalm. Yes, when you look at it and you see 176 verses, you're like, how am I going to get through this? That's why it's broken down. Eight verses a day eight verses a day. In 22 days, I guarantee you that you will find a new love, a new depth of appreciation for the word of God. It has to happen because as it says right here, God himself is going to teach us. Wow. I pray that this man has fed you tonight. I pray that you have been fed, that this is something you can take with you this week. Many of us have midweek Bible studies out here. Many of us, obviously, many of us have Sunday services, sometimes Saturday, whatever your church happens to do. But these Monday nights are important to me to be here for you, that we can learn the word of God together. So if this has blessed you, Isaiah 55, 11 says, God's word does not return void. It reaches all those people he intends it to reach. So if you're here tonight and this rich, reached you, or you're going to watch this on a replay, and this has spoken to you, guess what? Isaiah 55, 11 applies to you. You receive the word. So I encourage you, just share this with other people who else may need to hear this or see this. If you know of someone that needs encouragement, someone who needs to be brought back to the word of God, someone else who needs to hear a message of encouragement that God is with us, that God is here, and what we have to do is be obedient to his word. If you know someone, share this. This has nothing to do with me. This, this is the word of God going out. Next, I would say be a Berean, Acts 17, 11. You know, those of us online, we have a small online church family. And we call ourselves Bereans for life. You know why? Because every single day we do what the Bereans do. We search the scriptures daily to make sure what we're hearing is true. I encourage you, take everything that I, any other Bible teacher, anyone you listen to, Anyone who preaches or teaches the word of God, you have an obligation to write down the scripture references, write down the main points, and then study the word for yourself. Second Timothy tells us, study to be approved as a workman, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is a command. If we just take anything at just face value, we can fall into all kinds of heresy, all kinds of wickedness. And I see it. I see it almost every day. And I hate to admit this. But almost every day I have to block somebody 
on social media because they're preaching nonsense. They're preaching something that has nothing to do with the Bible. Does that mean I'm a Bible expert and I know it all? No, but I'll tell you this. I know when I hear false doctrine. I know when I hear something that is not based in the word of God. Oh, I know it. I know it. You could feel it. And there's no biblical basis for what some of this stuff is said. Do yourself a huge favor. Be a Berean. I don't care what church you go to. If you're reading the latest bestseller from your favorite Christian author, if you are online somewhere, if social media, if you belong to a Bible study, be a diligent Berean. If you've never hear anything else from me, be a Berean. Lastly, would you please pray for this ministry? I know there are people that are praying for this ministry. I hear from you and you let me know that you're praying for me. And I let you know right back that I'm praying for you. Would you please pray that I stay healthy, that I stay bold, unwavering, on the front lines, no quit, no backing up, no retreat. See, I'm one of those preachers and one of those pastors that does not sugarcoat the word of God. I don't skip over sections. I don't tiptoe around certain topics. I am going to preach it and teach it exactly the way God says it. It's the only way to preach and teach. You can't play games with the word of God. You can't just pick and choose what you want to believe and what you don't. And as a preacher and as a pastor, I have to stand before almighty God and give an account for my life. And if I have to stand before God and say, well, I didn't want to talk about hell. I didn't want to talk about eternal damnation. It's going to scare the people. It's going to frighten away the donations. I'm going to answer to God for that. If you're looking for that kind of sugar-coated, easygoing, motivational speech you got the wrong pastor here you got the wrong preacher that's not what you're going to find on this channel not going to happen never so i don't say that to blow my own horn i say please pray for me because the devil hates what i do he has been trying for years to destroy this ministry last year he nearly knocked us off the air nearly took us out of the game uh, we're still not back to full strength because there is no big salary here and we we count on donations. We count on offerings. And so the last thing I would say to you is if God is leading you to support us financially, you don't have to. If God is leading you to support us financially, you can certainly do that in three ways. Number one, if you're on Facebook, we accept uh, offerings through Facebook Messenger. It's quick, it's easy, and it's safe and secure. Less than a minute, it's done. We also have a PayPal account, Living in Harmony. It's capital L, capital H, Living in Harmony, all one word, at mail.com. That's our PayPal address. And we also have a couple of people that send in checks or money orders, you know, through the mail. If that's an option for you, please get in touch with me and I will provide the mailing address for us. But listen, this is not a ministry and I'm not a preacher that says you have to pay me for prophecy. You don't have to pay me for me to pray with you. You don't have to pay. And many of you know this because I, I'm, I'm on like all the time. I'm always praying. And many of you reach out to me. It could be three in the morning and I'm going to talk with you and I'm going to pray with you because that's my calling. It's not a boast. It's what God called me to do. But you don't have to pay me to do it. God will provide. So please keep me and keep this ministry in your prayers. And if God leads you to support us financially, we'd be very grateful, very grateful. And we would gratefully and humbly accept it. But if not, hey, I want you to come back every single time we're on the air because I want to fellowship with you. I want to be with you. I want us to learn the word of God together. And thank you for all of those hearts going up on Periscope. Thank you for all of that. I pray that you were blessed tonight. And we're going to end this transmission now because I don't want to get too long. I respect your time. And I'm not one of these pastors that's going to keep you on for hours. This is not going to happen. So thank you for being with me for this Monday night manna. I pray that you're fed. And I pray that you will spend time this week in Psalm 119. Thanks for being with me. God bless you.